My name is Anne Orford, and I would like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners of the land on which I'm presenting from this evening, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd like to welcome you all to this tribute panel hosted by the Australian and New Zealand Society of International Law to commemorate the contributions to the life of international law and international lawyers made by Judge James Crawford in his roles as judge, lawyer, scholar, supervisor, colleague, mentor, and friend. The news of James' death in May reverberated around the world and our thoughts in particular are with his family, a number of whom we're honored to welcome to the audience tonight. It was clear from the many heartfelt accounts of gratitude and celebration of James' life that immediately began to appear on social media, blog posts, uh, in exchanges between colleagues and in obituaries, that he ha had had an enormous effect, a profound effect on international lawyers in many places. But it was also clear that he meant something very special to international lawyers from this part of the world. So this evening's, for those of you who are in Australia, this evening's panel is designed to reflect on James' contributions to international law from an Antipodean perspective, which we're interpreting very broadly. So the panelists include academics and government lawyers from Australia and New Zealand, as well as two colleagues from the UK and Switzerland who we are treating as honorary Antipodeans because of their work with James, uh, including on the whaling case. So I'll say a little more about each presenter when I call on them, but I also wanted to note that my colleague uh, Jackie Peel had also hoped to join us, but thankfully for her, the internal state borders between Victoria and Queensland reopened last week, and she's been able to take a long planned and well-deserved family holiday. So as you will have seen, the panel is entitled 15 Glimpses of James Crawford. The title is a nod to an experimental biography by Craig Brown of Princess Margaret called Ma'am Darling, 99 Glimpses of Princess Margaret, which I highly recommend despite or perhaps because of my Republican sensibilities, which I gather from a number of the obituaries written about James I shared with him. And in what's been called a masterly work of bricolage, Brown assembled a series of vignettes that together built up a portrait of Queen Elizabeth's late sister, Princess Margaret. And Brown has said that the book was partly inspired by the way that Margaret appeared zelig-like in just about every other memoir, biography and diary written in the second half of the 20th century. Well, James Crawford has something of that same presence in international law. His name appears as counsel, arbitrator, and finally judge uh, in many of the cases and investment arbitration awards that we regularly teach. He played a major role in two of the most significant accomplishments of the International Law Commission in the form of the draft statute for an international criminal court and the draft articles on state responsibility. He supervised over 80 PhD students at Sydney and Cambridge, and almost every international lawyer seems to have a story to tell about him. So tonight's presenters have been invited to do just that, to share a brief story, anecdote, or recollection that says something about James' unique contributions to the life of international law. And we'll, at the end, invite members of the audience to contribute if they'd like to do so through the Q&A function there at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We are delighted that the audience for this evening's panel includes members of James' family and friends from around the world. And we're also recording the panel and we hope that it will provide a lasting tribute to James from the Australian and New Zealand Society of International Law. In addition, volume 40 of the Australian Yearbook of International Law will be dedicated to James' memory and the call for papers reflecting on his numerous contributions to the field of public international law 
particularly in Australia, is now available on the yearbook's website. So there have been numerous uh, accounts and obituaries of James' life published and presented over the past month. So we're not going to reproduce that format here, but let me just sketch the bare outlines of his career. He was born in 1948. He studied arts and law as an undergraduate at the University of Adelaide. And then he uh, undertook his PhD research at the University of Oxford under the supervision of Professor Ian Brownlee. That work became the book, The Creation of States in International Law. Uh, and we're told that that is the reason that Oxford introduced word limits on their theses. He then returned to Australia, taught at the University of Adelaide, and then moved to the University of Sydney, where he became the Chalice Professor of International Law and Dean at the Law School. Now, that would really be enough for many careers, uh, but that was just the beginning of James' career. He then left to take up the Huell Chair in International Law at Cambridge, which he held from 1992 to 2014, where he directed the Lauterpak Centre of International Law, and amongst other things, uh, also directed the Cambridge uh, International and Comparative Law series with Cambridge University Press, where I first uh, encountered him in the daunting task of uh, pitching my PhD manuscript to that series. James appeared in more than 100 cases in front of all, in almost all international courts and tribunals, uh, 29 or 30 of them before the International Court of Justice, I say that because the number varies across some reports, and I must admit I didn't actually count them up for tonight. But his very first appearance, as Freya Batens told us in the beautiful um, eulogy uh, at his uh, funeral ceremony, was in the Nauru case representing Nauru against Australia in 1992. And she noted there that was the last time Australia made the mistake of letting uh, James uh, represent the other side in a dispute. James was the first Australian elected to the United Nations International Law Commission. He was the second elected to the International Court of Justice, where he served from 2015 until his death. But that bare outline doesn't convey much of what James was like as a lawyer and a colleague. So now I would like uh, to turn to our panel and to introduce the first of tonight's speakers, Sir Kenneth Keith. So Sir Kenneth is, amongst many other things, a former judge of the International Court of Justice, and he's currently an honorary professor at Victoria University of Wellington. Sir Ken. Well, thank you very much, Anne. It's a great privilege to do this. As best as I can recall, I first became aware of James when I read his outstanding article in the 1979 American Journal of International Law on the international law standard in Australian and United Kingdom statutes. That article made some reference to New Zealand and Canadian legislation as well. He was then a very young senior lecturer in the, at the University of Adelaide. That article involved very diligent reading of many statutes back to the beginning of the century along with a splendid analysis, a mixture that was to be seen in the same year in his book, which has been mentioned, Creation of States. My next uh, contact with him was in the 1980s, when we were both members of our national law reform commissions. Um, James on the Australian Law Reform Commission and I on the New Zealand Law Commission. I drew on his work for the Commission on the Business of Foreign State Immunity, although I did it sub silentio in my separate opinion in the case between Germany and Italy on immunities. James also did a splendid report on Aboriginal customary title to think of the opening um, session at uh, this conference. It's a shame that um, the government did not act on that report. But I should focus on James's advocacy in my 
nine years on the International Court of Justice and in arbitral tribunals. I have been greatly helped by his advocacy and by the written proceedings to which he no doubt made major contributions. I know that many of my colleagues have been too. On my count, the case is number 15, several with a number of phases, uh, slightly less than the figures that do vary, as Anne said, um, slightly less than half of the cases that James argued in the Great Hall of Justice. The cases um, covered a wide range of matters, procedural issues, including jurisdiction, intervention and provisional measures, matters of substance, treaty interpretation, unilateral undertakings, the law of state, um, the, the law of the sea, territorial sovereignty, environmental issues, state responsibility, and many others. James and his great friend and colleague and occasional opponent, Alain Palais, seemed always to be the seemed always to be before the court in the most positive way, of course. James, along with Alain, was much more memorable than most counsel, many of whom had the unfortunate habit of droning on with their head down and not, engage, not engaging in any way with the judges. I did miss the rapid exchanges that I'd been used to in the other courts and tribunals on which I had sat. I give just one example of his advocacy. I will also add two comments on it. In the case about the Declaration of Independence of Kosovo, James appearing for the United Kingdom declared, looking along the bench and directly at all 15 of us, it's no easy task, said this, Mr. President and members of the court, I am a devoted but disgruntled South Australian. Quote, I hereby declare the independence of South Australia, close quotes. What has happened? Precisely nothing. Have I committed an internationally wrongful act in your presence? Of course not. Have I committed an ineffective act? Very likely. I have no representative capacity and no one will rally to my call. My first comment uh, on this sentence or two is this. At some later point, I asked James whether he was the first non-United Kingdom citizen to appear as counsel for that country. He had not even thought about that. When I checked, I discovered that that was the case. The fact that he had not thought about it was, I thought, striking, and his being briefed was, of course, a real mark of his standing. My second comment concerns Jocelyn, my wife, who has known James for nearly 40 years as well. She was born in Mount Gambier in South Australia. When she next met James, she made it very clear to him that she was to be the first president of the new state. And I have an Adelaide um, uh, scarf here to mark that event. Now, to be more serious, to conclude, as we say in my country, a mighty totara has fallen in the forest. Haere, James. Haere, haere, haere ra. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Ken. Uh, now I'd like to call on Matthew Newhouse, who is Australia's ambassador to the Netherlands. Thank you, Anne. It was one of the saddest days of my professional life when I stood with my wife Angela and James's widow Freya and two young children, Sydney and Eleanor, to watch James's hearse arrive, flanked by police motorcycle escort, into the grounds of the Peace Palace in The Hague on Monday the 7th of June for his funeral. The UN flag at half-mast, as was the Australian flag, 
at the embassy. The funeral in the majestic Great Hall of Justice was impressive and dignified. His coffin was covered in the UN flag and flanked by an honor guard. Fellow judges and ambassadors bowed in tribute. The ICJ president, Joan Donoghue, gave a moving address and Bach St. Matthew's Passion played in the background. James would have been quietly impressed and probably had some humorous remark to make, but if only it had not been him. Despite his long struggle with Parkinson's and battle over recent years with multiple health challenges, James was not ready to go. He tried so hard to hold on for his family and his work, and Freya was devoted in her care for him. In the words of the Robert Frost poem, read so movingly by six-year-old son Sidney at the more personal funeral that followed, he had, quote, promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. Yet the final sleep had come and he had achieved so much. My mind went back to another great hall and another time, to the United Nations in 1991 and the vote in the General Assembly which saw James elected to the International Law Commission. It was my first experience of a multilateral candidacy as a young and newly arrived First Secretary Legal Advisor at our UN mission in New York, but I could not have had a better candidate to cut my teeth on as campaign manager. And it did not matter that James was appearing against us in the Nauru case at that time. He was, after all, the best Australian candidate. Everyone already knew 42-year-old Professor Crawford, and he seemed to know them. He was famous for his book on the creation of states in international law. Since his mid-30s, he had been Chalice Professor of International Law at Sydney University and had just been elected to the prestigious Huell Chair at Cambridge. Not only did everyone know him, everyone also wanted to vote for him. I have never had an easier candidacy at one level, although it was hard work because he was determined with his great energy to see every delegation. Only our Foreign Minister, Gareth Evans, had more energy and James's humour was better. My recollection is that he topped the poll. But this was not enough. Already, Gareth Evans, a close friend of James, and with their two great minds only eclipsed by our seriously brainy intellectual permanent representative, Peter Walensky, saw it as preparation for an eventual run for the International Court of Justice. We planned decades ahead in those days. We spoke too of what James could do on the ILC. The first priority was that he bring to a conclusion its work of many decades on a code for an international criminal court. He did so within his first year, providing the foundation for the Rome Statute and the ICC we have today. I had the privilege of connecting with James many times over subsequent years, especially at the Lauterpack Centre in Cambridge, my other alma mater. One of the great things about James was he was no narrow lawyer. He saw international law as based in international politics and values, as illustrated in his 1993 Cambridge inaugural election, Democracy in International Law. I was particularly grateful to him for his help on a paper written at Cambridge as a visiting fellow in late 1994 and subsequent, subsequently published in 1995 on the UN's 50th anniversary as the UN at 50, the need for realism, a response to the more idealistic views of the UN's role in the early 1990s, which faltered in the hills of Bosnia and Rwanda and the sands of Somalia, and so much more since. It was a great joy to connect again in the Hague, where we had reached the pinnacle of our respective careers as judge and ambassador, and celebrate significant birthdays and Christmas together with our families while working together to protect the rules-based international order now under so much threat. My last glimpse though is in Lagos, Nigeria, 20 years before in the year 2000. I was in my first head of mission post and James visited with his great mentor Brownlee as counsel for Nigeria in the Bakasi case with Cameroon. It illustrates the many diverse cases across the globe James was involved in, 
some 30 or more according to his obituaries. Few even know how his wise counsel helped in the resolution of the Bakasi issue at the time, which was a significant regional conflict. After a good concluding dinner and wine, he liked his wine, at the residence, James was delighted to join me in my official car with the Australian flag flying and police outriders and sirens dashing through the Lagos nighttime traffic jam to the airport with Brownlee following in our wake. He loved the drama of it, but above all, he loved being behind the Australian flag. He was a proud Australian, indeed South Australian, as Sir Kenneth Keith has just reminded us with his famous declaration of South Australian independence. He was, but he was above all a proud Australian while a great globalist. Perhaps his best legacy is his education of a generation of Australian international lawyers whose duty now is to follow in his footsteps. We must now ensure the most worthy Australian successor fills the seat he leaves so empty at the International Court. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, I'd now like to turn to Professor Hilary Charlesworth, Melbourne Laureate Professor at Melbourne Law School, distinguished mm -hmm. professor at the Australian National University, and currently judge ad hoc of the International Court of Justice in the arbitral award of 3rd October 1899, the Guiana and Venezuela case. Thanks, Anne. I, I start like you by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose land I am this evening. And Anne, I want to thank you very, very much for bringing us all together. It was your idea and it just touched such a nerve. So I'm incredibly grateful to you. Well, as Anne's told us, the idea of the panel is to see James from many different angles, perhaps not as salaciously as Princess Margaret. But what I've been really struck by is what a consistent picture of James emerges in all the tributes that have been available on social media and in the press since his death. It seems universally acknowledged that James was a brilliant scholar. He also had a great intellectual generosity for an example, uh, a capacity to bring order, creativity and finality to intellectual tasks that was sorely foundering. Uh, Matthew's already mentioned his work at the ILC, uh, on uh, the, which the presage to the International Criminal Court, to his work on state responsibility, and of course his work on customary law here in Australia, the Australian Law Reform Commission reference that Ken Keith has mentioned. He was, it's universally agreed, an inspiring teacher, supervisor and mentor. And as Tony Angie told us yesterday, and this is my own personal experience, a disarmingly honest assessor of quality. James had a keen sense of responsibility towards the discipline of international law. This included in his scholarship, charting its reach and resolving its puzzles. His sense of duty to the discipline extended to shoring up international institutions and the civil society of international law. It also included nurturing generations of scholars across the globe, even those like me with whom he had no institutional affiliation. Now, I first met James in 1980, uh, in February 1980, when I was a law student. I was a member of the University of Melbourne uh, Jessup Moot team, and my university was hosting the Australian competition. In those days, I have to admit, this competition was not like it was today in Australia. It wasn't at all competitive. I think there were just three or four universities uh, taking part. And that event was my uh, occasion to meet also that other grand figure of international law in Australia, uh, our beloved Ivan Shearer. James was then at Adelaide Law School and was considered the font of wisdom on the Jessup as he'd coached the winning Adelaide team in the international competition the previous year. Uh, and of course, he had a reputation by then already as a brilliant scholar. Now, I had assumed that this famous person would be resolutely middle-aged or elderly to have achieved so much. And I was slightly startled and surprised by his youthful, energetic presence. James was dressed very casually, and I first mistook him uh, as actually as a student mooter. But James blew us junior mooters all away. He was so full of life, so charismatic and so clever. When he acted as a judge in the moots, 
his really understated manner of asking questions, and I, I still recall that the topic of that year was the international law of outer space, his, his very uh, quiet way of asking questions often lulled us into thinking that they could be easily answered. We quickly discovered that James's questions would take us far beyond our limited international legal knowledge. Then he would firmly, but gently, point out where we had got lost. But the anecdote I want to offer is much more recent. As many people have noted, James had a deep knowledge and appreciation of art, music and literature. I really treasure a conversation I had with him in The Hague about three years ago about the choices of art he made for the covers of his books. I was struck by the fact he'd thought through all aspects of the artwork in, in great detail. I remember in his office at the ICJ, he plucked various of his books from his shelves and he'd asked me if I could see why he'd chosen a particular image for that book. And I have to admit, I failed most of this quiz, missing the subtlety of his choices. I'm just going to share an image here. done this just to show you this image of uh, James's book. So I recall in that conversation, he really lingered on the British artist Kenneth Martin's work, which was called, this one is called Chance Order Change 12. And James, of course, as you can see here, used it on the cover of his Hague lectures in 2013. And of course, uh, he used the title of the artwork as the title of his lectures. So this piece of art is one of an extensive series of works with an identical title made in the 1970s and 80s at the end of Kenneth Martin's life. He died in the mid 1980s. Now, what's interesting about uh, Martin's work is that he used, as you can see here, a squared grid numbered around the edges in planning his artworks where the lines intersected on the boundaries. You can see those numbers. And then what he'd do is to write the numbers on small pieces of paper, put in an envelope, and then would choose them at random. So each pair of numbers was then joined on the grid to make a line, allowing a really complex rhythm of lines to evolve. And then Martin, the artist, would decide on the characteristics of each line, what length it would be, its scale, its thickness, and its place in the order of sequence. So we can see that Martin's paintings are a combination of rules and invention but they also celebrate the power of randomness and chance. So to me, this artwork on the cover of James's book captures beautifully his insight that international law is a complex mixture of abstract principle, history and imagination. I think James was unique in combining huge professional achievements with a winsome, endearing personality. I feel so fortunate to have known James and I'm thrilled to be part of this event celebrating his life in all its richness. His brilliant ideas, his perceptive advice, his dry sense of humour and his affectionate nature. Over to you, Anne. Thank you, Hilary. So now I'd like to turn to Laurence Poisson de Chazun, one of our honorary Antipodeans, uh, who is a professor of international law at the University of Geneva and also a member of Matrix Chambers. Thank you, Anne. And uh, it's going to be a voice with a French accent because James was universal, so we all liked James. Um, I was very honored to be invited and I thought a lot about how I met James and what we did. So I remember that uh, we met with James in the 90s and I was struck by his integrity. James was a man of integrity and being a man of integrity, he was always keen to promote the rule of law. So we met for the first time when we were representing the Solomon Islands, Samoa and the Marshall Islands in the context of the request for an advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice on the legality of the use of nuclear weapons. In the context of these proceedings, uh, James acted, as he always has done, with professionalism and efficiency. I say so because James, for me, 
knew how to use words and language. Not a single word was redundant. Each of them had a role to play in the message that James was conveying. I was also able to admire James' talents when we were involved in the drafting of legal opinions for non-government organizations and foundations on issues such as fresh water or the protection of the whales. And it has been said, but James had a great knowledge in law, but also in other areas, history, arts, and so on. And what I admired with James, he was always willing to engage in legal matters without fear, anything to promote the rule of law. I've learned a lot with working with James. And some have already spoken about the International Law Commission being in Geneva. I was able to meet with him and to see how he was working at the International Law Commission. And I was just struck by the fact that he would be able to listen to people and he would listen and listen but he was also able to make legal moves so that he would have the majority with him to endorse what he, he proposed. And his legacy, at that has been said, is immense. So though there are a lot of collections, but what I have one, which is, I think, the fondest memory I have uh, about James and collaborating with him. And it was when, uh, thanks to James, uh, I joined the Australian team in the whaling case. And I remember one day sitting in a room in Canberra with James, Bill Campbell, Philip Sands, Stephanie Yerino, and other colleagues. And I was thinking how privileged I am to be sitting in this room with the sharp man, minds and having James in front of me. This was a pure moment of happiness, and I thank James for that. The time of the oral hearings for the whaling case is also a vivid memory. He was delivering sharp to the point oral pleadings, while at the same time giving the general course at the Hague Academy of International Law. So James was able to do many things at the same time, but unlike many of us, he was doing all these things very well, and I have great respect for that. As a Francophone, I would also like to say, and I've seen James quite often in Swiss universities, in French universities, James was very keen on having the French speaking lawyers and the English speaking lawyers working together. He was a great legal figure for the Francophone world and we miss him. We miss James the friend, we miss James the professor, we miss James the practitioner, and we miss James the human being. But I can't end this short talk without mentioning also the fond memories I have of James and Freya and their two kids in The Hague. When we would meet, and it was often in the summer, like for many of us, uh, we would have nice dinners with, together with James, Freya and other friends. And they liked, and James liked food and wine. He was a very good company. James was very happy. I remember I have very fond memories of his happiness. So today there are very, there are a lot of people mourning James, his family, his children, and Freya, Sidley, and Eleanor who are in the Hague. And my thoughts, my thoughts go to all of these people who are mourning James. Thank you. Thank you, Laurence. Uh, now I would like to invite Caroline Foster, Associate Professor at the University of Auckland, to share her reflections. Thank you, Anne, and um, good evening, everybody. I first came to Cambridge after a number of years legal and policy work with the New Zealand Foreign Ministry, including a year in Santiago in Chile. And immediately I found James teaching engaging and stimulating there was a conceptual and an intellectual factor that made the learning experience different to any other. I think it was in part because James had a strong understanding of the state, um, both as a practitioner uh, as well as critically as an academic. And it was from government practice that I entered the program. So I did the LLM from 96 to 97 and James taught law of peace. Philip Allett taught history and theory of international law. 
Uh, John Dugard taught international criminal and Vaughan Lowe taught international dispute settlement. James' law of peace course reflected a good deal that was happening in the development of international law. Uh, and of course, a good proportion of that was oriented around the state. This included the Hungary Slovakia case in the International Court of Justice in which James had represented Hungary. And the interface between that case and the ILC articles on state responsibility for which James was special rapporteur. A role through which he played the pivotal part finally in bringing about a product that has stood the test of time extremely well to date and received increasing endorsement. His own doctoral work and subsequent book had of course focused on the formation of states. Um, and my LLM dissertation overseen by him was on the self-determination of indigenous peoples. So there was an overlap and also an overlap with James' work on Aboriginal customary law with the Australian Law Reform Commission in the 1980s. James gave us all good advice. And in my experience, he was something of an oracle. Uh, so on an academic international law question, he might say little, but it would probably be exactly the insight that you needed and you probably wouldn't have received it from anyone else. He also gave concrete and practical help when needed. Colleagues whose entire doctoral work in progress was lost in a burglary were supported and advised by James, who also helped to make available appropriate career opportunities for them. He also took action that was prompt and fair in my personal experience when, um, when the terms of the Hill Scholarship were changed between when it was advertised and when I was awarded it, and he had it addressed directly. He then examined my PhD at Cambridge together with Alan Boyle, and it was truly amazing to receive their four pages or more, it may have even been six, of critical thoughts and ideas, which helped then me in developing the work further uh, for eventual publication um, in a book with CUP. I last had time with James in The Hague in 2018, uh, and I especially enjoyed our conversation then about major new works in international law. And this visit was, was a nice counterpoint to the time that he visited New Zealand in the 1990s when we went out for coffee on Lampton Quay, uh, a day on which he remarked how very blue the sky was. In closing, together with many others, I shall miss his central presence in the international law field. Um, and I'm grateful uh, to have had this opportunity to say a few words. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, now we'll turn to Bill Campbell. Bill was variously general counsel, international law, and head of the Office of International Law in the Australian uh, Commonwealth Attorney General's Department from 1996 to 2018. And he's currently honorary professor at the ANU College of Law. Um, thanks, Anne, and it's such a pleasure to be part of this tribute to James, and um, thank you so much, Anne, for organising it. As Hilary alluded to, James had many talents, um, not least as a poet. Perhaps his most famous poem concerned Mr. Cardi, published in Eagle Talks in 2013. I'll just read it, it's quite short. While wandering through a wadi in the wastes of Saudi, I came across Mr. Cardi cracking rather hardy. I said, you must feel blue at what they've done to you. And he said to me, that's true, but I've got the CJEU, lacking whose authority, the P5 sorority, and now a small minority who've lost their old priority. And so went Mr. Cardi wandering down his wadi. It's all because of me. I killed Article 103. Now this poem, was written at the same time as the oral argument in the whaling case before the, the ICJ. And at the same time, I was also James's de facto campaign manager for the forthcoming elections to the ICJ. And it was made known to me that certain unnamed members of the P5 sorority felt James's prowess as a poet was not enhancing his electoral prospects. <clears throat> 
So being ever cautious, something that James I don't think could be accused of, I asked him to forego, forego writing poetry until after the election, and he duly obliged with one exception. To me, that poem has an Australianness about it, both in its content and in its humour, and that's not surprising because James was Australian to the core. In my experience, he was ready to provide assistance to his home country at the drop of a hat, even if to do so might have had adverse consequences for him. Now, in that respect, uh, I was concerned that representing Australia before the ICJ in the documents case brought by Timor Leste during the last throes of his campaign would do nothing for his prospects. He dismissed these concerns, noting that he was always available to advise and represent Australia, and he was. I first met James when I was a student at University College London in 1979. Several students studying the law of the sea at various colleges across the University of London, including my own, decamped to LSE when James spent a semester teaching the subject there. Even then, his reputation preceded him. Now, our principal period of interaction was between 1999, commencing with the Southern Bluefin tuna cases in Hamburg, and November 2015, when I witnessed his election to the ICJ at the United Nations. Our mutual efforts had their ups and downs. I still have the note James passed to me when, in 1999, it lost ordered provisional measures favourable to Australia and New Zealand in the tuna cases. His note simply read, brilliant. And I'm sure there would have been a similar note had James been present when the ICJ gave its decision in the whaling case, a case in which he played such a pivotal role through provision of the underpinning initial uh, legal advice assisted by Stefarino and as lead counsel. And it's striking how similar the outcome of that case was to that predicted by James in his initial advice. On the other side of the ledger, he was somewhat devastated by Australia's loss on jurisdiction before the first ever Annex 7 arbitration under the 1982 convention in 2000, again, the SBT cases. And I hope he gained a degree of comfort from the still ongoing critical analysis of the decision of the majority in that case, noting that Sir Kenneth Keith was in the minority. Um, James and I did have our differences, uh, the most serious being over the advice to government given both here and in the UK concerning intervention in Iraq in 2003. Those differences, though strongly held, were never personal. Um, before I close, let me mention a few characteristics of James, some have mentioned already, that I drew from my work with him. The first is that the, the direction and opportunity he gave to the younger lawyers in various Australian litigation teams. James encouraged contributions from every member of the delegation, including at delegation meetings. He also gave willingly of his time to have Q&A sessions with uh, AGD and DFAT whenever in Canberra. And James recognised that each person had a role to play. As agent for Australia, I asked him to take the lead in preliminary meetings with then ICJ acting President Tomka in the whaling case. He said to me, that's your job, Bill, and encouraged me to do the talking. And I suppose this was an example of his directness as well. Um, as noted earlier, his actions and words evinced honesty and integrity, um, examples of which, the examples of which I know of many, are many. Uh, I did, he did have an enormous capacity for, for work. And for example, as noted by Laurence, he was lead counsel for Australia in the oral hearings in the whaling case. At the same time, he was presenting his seminal 2013 Hague Lectures uh, series entitled Chance or to Change the Course of International Law. I was a bit worried about the effects of that dual commitment on the presentation of the whaling case, um, but I shouldn't be. Courts and tribunals 
as Sir Ken has noted, respected and listened to James. And this was very evident and it was very important to his clients, including Australia. His presentations to the court evinced the same ever present sense of humour as the Cardi poem I mentioned earlier. So that takes me back to where I began. The one exception to his undertaking to forego writing poetry before the ICJ elections. After the final round of oral submissions in the Whaling case, we had, for those involved, um, a now infamous delegation party down at Sherveningham Beach, which James and his son Jetty attended. As part of the proceedings, James read a poem, a newly penned poem, entitled, You Are Old, Agent William, with apologies to Lewis Carroll. Now, the poem bore all the hallmarks of honesty, directness, and humour I mentioned earlier. And for that reason, I won't be reading it tonight. It remains, however, one of my most prized, if not secret, possessions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Agent William. Uh, and now we'll hand over to Victoria Hallam, Chief International Legal Advisor at the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. E na reo, e na mana, e rangatirama, te na koto katoa. Simon Chesterfield's tribute for James Crawford on the Lowy Institute's website is titled James Crawford, Scholar, Advocate and Judge. It says that while many might hope for success in one of these areas, James was great at them all, which would have been galling had he not been such a wonderful human being. Well, it may amuse you to learn that I am here to talk about James's skill in a fourth area in which he was also great. My glimpse of James Crawford is not James as a scholar, advocate or judge, but James as a skilled and wily navigator of the shadowy and complex ways in which states engage in the development of international law and in particular customary international law. And that is the story I want to tell today. James was a man who knew what he wanted and was very capable at navigating to his destination. The time and location is New York around the year 2000. I was posted to the UN as the New Zealand delegate to the legal committee, known as the Sixth Committee. James was a member of the International Law Commission and his mammoth work on state responsibility was coming to fruition. He was in New York to meet with the government delegates of the Sixth Committee about his work, which would soon be presented to the Committee for Deliberation and Action. I already knew James, having met him earlier in 1995 at The Hague during the nuclear test case. I greatly admired him and was keen to learn what I could do to ensure that the draft articles on state responsibility were taken forward by governments, and I was ready to assist in whatever way I could including in my role as vice chair of the committee, which I held at the time. Those of you familiar with the International Law Commission will know that one of its main roles is the progressive development of international law, which is described in Article 15 of the statute as the preparation of draft conventions. For this reason, I had assumed that my role would be to promote the draft articles, negotiate a very strong endorsement from the Sixth Committee, and perhaps to lobby for the articles to be turned into a convention. I was up for the challenge. To my surprise, and I admit my disappointment, James was looking for no such action from me. In fact, he said the very last thing he wanted was for the Sixth Committee to get their hands on his draft articles and start discussing the substance of them. That, he thought, would be disastrous. Instead, all he wanted from me was to make sure that the Sixth Committee simply noted the draft articles. Imagine my surprise, given that noting in the General Assembly hierarchy of verbs is the lowest bar imaginable, faint praise indeed. Clearly this had been the subject of considerable debate in the Commission, and there were Commission members, and no doubt states, who thought there should be a diplomatic conference or a preparatory commission so governments could consider the articles in detail and take decisions on them. However, James knew government delegates far too well and he wouldn't have a bar of it. 
He was not willing to run the risk of a long and unproductive negotiation by states, which in turn could lead to an unravelling of his carefully articulated draft articles and commentaries, which could even have had a decodifying effect. Instead, he wanted them simply noted and appended to the younger resolution, and that they be then left to sit on the shelf thereafter. The beauty of his solution, I remember him telling me, was that the draft articles would stand on their own merits and over time would prove their value and gain prominence. So that is indeed what we managed to deliver from the UN General Assembly later that year. The key operative paragraph of the resolution states simply that the UN General Assembly takes note of the articles on responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts presented by the International Law Commission, the text of which is annexed to the present resolution and commends them to the attention of governments without prejudice to the question of their future adoption or any other appropriate action. So indeed, sit on the shelf, the articles did, and they continue to do so 20 years later, more than 20 years later. They certainly sit on the shelf of our legal library at the legal division of the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, as well as on many of our desks and in the chambers of international courts and tribunals and the offices of international organization and no doubt many other places. Here is our copy, well thumbed and marked, as a sign of its frequent use as a reference guide in the day-to-day -day practice of states. James's articles on state responsibility have become the authoritative go-to guide for practitioners of international law, which is exactly as James intended it. Hi, Radar James, you are navigating amongst the stars now. Kia ora. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, we'll now turn to Margaret Young, professor at Melbourne Law School. Thank you very much, Anne. I wish to focus my comments tonight on James's remarkable qualities of service, strength and positive state of mind. My glimpses come from my experience of having James as my PhD supervisor, mentor and friend, although his influence began well before this and will be enduring. So let me begin with James's service, which was peerless towards his colleagues friends and clients, and later to the court, but which also extended to incredible generosity towards his students. When I arrived to Cambridge for the LLM, I expected this towering and famous figure of international law to be aloof and unavailable. Instead, Professor Crawford readily agreed to a proposed class trip to the ICJ, where a group of students watched as he delivered oral submissions in the oil platforms dispute. He arranged for us to meet Judge Rosalind Higgins in a side room of the Peace Palace. He shared a beer with us. International adjudication was suddenly accessible and real. James's work ethic is, of course, legendary. I have one anecdote from his time as my PhD supervisor, which I have to be careful not to share too broadly for fear of raising expectations of my own PhD students. After a long PhD, which I had intermitted during my work at the WTO and then again during my pregnancy, I was finally ready to submit. I sent my full manuscript to James, expecting a reply within a few weeks. The next morning, there was in my inbox an email from James. Attached was the full manuscript with tracked changes and some highlighted text. James's practice was to highlight in green any words or passages that needed attention. It reads well and can be submitted, he wrote. It is generally less precious in expression, though there is a residual outbreak at the end of chapter three, much greened. Well done. I hope my PhD students never learned that James had read through my entire manuscript, corrected it and given it the go ahead all in the space of one night. I want to now turn to James's strength. James's intellect and humanity came through even in the minutest of interactions. He was crisp, but caring. In the home stretch of the PhD, he encouraged me, thesis, 
thesis, baby thesis. Ever aware of gender barriers and wanting to support women, he, Joanne Scott and John Bell encouraged me to apply for the Pembroke Louder Pact Junior Research Fellowship. I had coaching from the late Amanda Perro sasson another wonderful international lawyer and friend of James, and won the spot. This position enabled me to work closely with James as director of the centre, watching bemusedly as he closed his eyes during a Friday lunchtime lecture to the shock of the new students, and then summarised and critiqued the presenter with acuity and flair. James was direct with praise and criticism, as I saw in his responses to my PhD draft chapters. Some snippets. A lot of promising material, though the presentation is ragged. Or, many problems of formulation, I fear. See you on Tuesday. A more positive draft from me inspired literary reflections. Uh, and I quote, it is well and clearly written, it is well informed, press on with Milton tomorrow to fresh topics and chapters new. His perceptiveness to my growing arguments about fragmentation and regime interaction allowed me to hone in on the legal dilemmas regarding sovereignty, uh, which I was glad to reflect upon in the fresh shift curated by Freya and Christine in 2015. James's principled commitments were in evidence at the personal and professional level. This shouldn't surprise us given how extensively he had reflected on issues of responsibility and especially state responsibility to the collective, a special interest for those of us working on environmental harm. I was supremely proud when he publicly denounced the UK's invasion of Iraq. This at a time when many of his Cambridge students were joining mass protests against the invasion in London with breach of international law, a dominant theme. Finally, I wish to offer some glimpses about James's state of mind and primarily his laconic humour. When I arrived to the Lauterpack Centre one day in loose calottes, a very Melbourne inner city in a north look, I, <laughs> I <laughs> encountered James's surprise and he asked dryly whether I was going to the beach. <laughs> he thought it a hoot that I had a twin sister at Harvard while I was at Cambridge. And he was in such an in-demand speaker that he had cause to be at both Cambridges, which occasioned some great jests. He saw joy in children and was incredibly adept at soothing unsettled babies, joking that he was similarly skilled with his own brood until they grew older. When I have met his other children, I have noted independence and wit in them too. And when I last saw James in The Hague, in a quiet family luncheon with Freya and Sydney in his courtyard, I saw again how important family was to him. A true great, James combined extraordinary qualities of service, strength and state of mind. James's death is hard to accept, but his role as mentor, friend and teacher continues. For this and for the foundations he built for a just and safe international legal order, he has our everlasting gratitude. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, now, Stephanie Arino, Assistant Secretary in the Office of International Law in Australia's Attorney General's Department. Thanks very much, Anne. Um, it's such an honour to be here this evening uh, and to contribute my perspective to others' glimpses of Jane's. I first met James in Cambridge at the end of my LLM year in the summer of 2007. Um, as many of you will know, during his tenure at Cambridge, James had a habit of hiring students and recent graduates to assist him with his caseload and academic writing. And this was just one of the many examples of his generosity in inspiring, mentoring and training the next generation of international lawyers and in particular, the army of aspiring international Australian lawyers who followed him to Cambridge. So in June 2007, James was conducting his annual hunt for new research associates, and I was invited for an interview with him at his office in the Lauterpatch Centre. I was so nervous in anticipation of this first meeting. But James instantly put me at ease, exhibiting two quintessentially Australian traits, a dry sense of humour and a fascination with the cricket in his selection of our opening topics of conversation. 
He began with a review of my LLM results. Eyebrows quizzically raised as he gently, but also quite seriously teased me about whether my results might perhaps have been more in line with his expectations had I not been distracted by the multiple multitude of Cambridge social traditions that tended to, to divert Australian LLMs from spending as much time as they should in the Squire Law Library. Um, and to be fair, as always, um, James was pretty close to the mark in, in making that assessment. He then followed up with an inquiry about my interest in the cricket, um, and in particular, whether I was following the tour match that was underway on the day of my interview. Um, I wasn't, um, but managed to offer some reasonably credible remarks that indicated that I was wasn't entirely ignorant about this great Australian pastime. Later in our discussion, we did indeed get on to matters of international law, um, which left me with much food for thought, as always, um, as always, as on, with discussion of James on matters of substance. Luckily for me, James must have decided that my sense of humour and ability to hold a reasonably well-informed conversation about the fortunes of the Australian cricket team outweighed any perceived deficiencies in my LLM results, and he subsequently hired me as his research associate, a role that I retained until late 2008. In retrospect, I look back on my time spent working with James in Cambridge with some astonishment. Not only his generosity with his time and his expertise, given the other extraordinary demands on his time, but also on, at the enormous trust he placed in his research associates in so wholly bringing us into the remarkable array of work he had on his plate at such an early phase of our career. In terms of the substantive matters on which I worked with James, um, it is the Whaling case that I particularly wanted to mention as that case represented the common thread in our working relationship, both during my time with him as a research associate, um, but also following my move back to Australia and to the Office of International Law in Canberra. In particular, my work in supporting James as City Council for Australia in that case gave me a front row seat to his brilliance as counsel and as advocate. I swiftly discovered that although I could ably support him in formulating and in shaping the nature of the arguments he would make, it was James who brought the speeches to life for the court. In particular, as Bill and Sir Ken have already noted, James had a unique gift for inje injecting unexpected moments of levity into his speeches, inserting at just the right moment a humorous analogy or a cultural or literary reference, which brought home for the judges the practical consequences of his argument, a gift he used to, de to devastating effect in the Whaling case. Um, so in short, although I certainly don't presume to have known James as well as, as others participating in this panel, I feel privileged to have known him at all. To have had the opportunity to benefit from his kindness, his generosity, and of course his brilliance as an international lawyer, counsel and advocate. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone in saying that I wouldn't be sitting where I am today if it wasn't for James taking a chance on me early in my career and supporting me. I'm so sorry that the next generation of Australian international lawyers won't have the opportunity to know him. Um, but I have no doubt that his legacy will live on both through his writings and through those that did have the opportunity to know and to learn from him. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Uh, so now Penelope Ridings, who is amongst other things, former Chief International Legal, Legal Advisor for New Zealand's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. She currently holds an honorary position at the University of Auckland and is the New Zealand candidate for the International Law Commission. Tēnā uh, I would like to first thank uh, Anne for organising this tribute to James, a legend in international law and a friend to New Zealand. So James was counsel for New Zealand in the Southern Roof and Tuna cases, and I knew him when I was agent for New Zealand in the Whaling case. My colleagues have shared with me their recollection of working with James on SBT. So I'm providing this tribute also on behalf of Bill Mansfield, Tim Corley and Ilana Geddes. All the New Zealanders who worked with James on Southern Roof and Tuna shared a common perspective. What stood out most was his support for the younger members of the Australian and New Zealand teams. As we've heard during Ansel already, 
He took seriously what other people, especially younger people, had to say. In the SBT case, he listened to the younger members of the New Zealand and Australian teams and made sure that they had the opportunity to appear before and present arguments to the tribunal. Both in this and more generally, his kindness, his encouragement, his compliments and his support to younger lawyers brought out the best in them and in the true fashion of a great mentor. I want to recall here that the SBT case and the whaling case were very different. In SBT, New Zealand and Australia were parties in the same interest, presenting a joint case. In the whaling case, New Zealand was an intervener and not a party to the dispute. James, as we've already heard, had the highest standards of integrity and it was very proper in our dealings during the whaling case. We deliberately kept our distance. There was certainly no collusion, despite allegations to that effect. This circumspection extended to ensuring that the Australian and New Zealand teams were accommodated in different hotels in The Hague. In a strange twist of fate, this led to the New Zealand team being in the same hotel as the Japanese legal team. Uh, this becomes relevant for a small vignette, which I think illustrates James's contribution to international advocacy. We've already heard that James was a powerful advocate. He combined his razor sharp legal analysis with good humor and also with humility. He understood that persuasive advocacy stimulated an emotional response in the, in the listener. His use of photographs in the Nauru case and in the whaling case has already been remarked at uh, during this answer by Hilary Charlesworth. But beyond this, he also understood how a person was likely to react to submissions. He appreciated how judges may respond to the presentations they heard. So I have an example which demonstrates this. One of the most memorable days of the whaling oral hearing was the cross-examination by the Australian Solicitor General, Justin Gleeson, of the scientific expert put forward by Japan. It was a masterful demonstration of how to get an expert witness to give an opinion that was not in their original evidence. It was an extremely effective cross-examination, but it was what some might call brutal. At breakfast at the hotel the next morning, a member of the Japanese legal team expressed some unease at the cross-examination of their expert. I sensed that they were thinking that the ICJ is the international bar, not the criminal bar. James recognised the unconscious impact that the cross-examination may have had on the ICJ judges. In his last submissions to the court, and he said, and I quote this, I understand the reservations that some members of the court may have had at what may seem the in interposition of common law methods into the court's fact-finding and evidence assessing process. He then pivoted to highlight that the court was a court of law which should focus on the precise issues in the case. But in this acknowledgement, and this is why I raised it, James demonstrated his understanding of people. He was perceptive and empathetic. It was not just a question of IQ, but of EQ. This combination made him not only a superb international advocate, but a kind and thoughtful human being. He understood that the smallest kindness, the smallest expressions of appreciation, the smallest praise can sometimes have the biggest impact. And that's what I remember most about James. He will be missed, Haidera. Thank you, Penny. Uh, now, Juliet McIntyre, who's a lecturer in law at the University of South Australia and also a PhD student at the University of Melbourne. Good evening, everyone. And I'd just like to begin by saying thank you to Anne for organising this wonderful panel. It's, it's just very moving to share these reminiscences um, and I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you tonight from the traditional lands of the Ghana people and pay my respects to their elders past and present. 
So I'm going to speak to you today about my time as James's research associate, which spanned over 2010 to 2012, and then afterwards as his uh, one of his LLM students. And I was probably his least qualified research associate of all time. I didn't even have a master's degree. I'd met some of these previous associates. They spoke three languages or they were the best oralist at Jessup. Um, but I was from Adelaide, which for James definitely counted for something. And in order to prepare for tonight, I went back through our very lengthy email correspondence, which I still have sort of filed away. And I wanted to share a couple of those emails with you tonight. Ah, Jay. Fine, Jay. No, Jay. There were a lot of emails along these lines, but however brusque some of James's communiques, his care, his humour and his humanity always shone through. Often we were working to very tight deadlines, but James was always the one to say to his research associates, at times I was only one of a few, he would say, don't overdo it, go home, take some time off. No matter how hard I worked, and there were some weeks that were well over 100 hours, James always worked harder. I could send an email at any time of the day, night or early morning, and I would receive a prompt reply. It was quite awe-inspiring. But one of the things I wanted to highlight was that James was always meticulous in thanking his research associates for their contribution to whatever project we were working on at the time however minor that contribution might have been. And I think this says a lot about his own humility and his support and acknowledgement of those who were working with him. And James was just as involved in the heavy stuff, the important moments of international law as he was in some of the fun stuff that we did too. We had a great time coming up with trivia questions for the European Society of International Law Conference in 2010. He was quite chuffed that Judge uh, Justice Swable had outgunned, and I quote him, outgunned Wiramantri in terms of length of judgments. And his 2012 short essay recounting a slightly embellished conversation with Marty Koskinemi regarding the cover art for the Cambridge Companion to International Law reveals not only his passionate interest in art and in the covers of his books, as Hilary has uh, mentioned, um, but also his great sense of humour. And we were asked tonight to reflect on James's unique style and contribution to international law. And so I sort of thought, well, I'll go through some of the issues and cases that we worked on together. And this is only a very, you know, truncated list of the matters that he was involved in during my time with him. There was a very significant ICSID case between Deutsche Bank and Sri Lanka. He was, of course, director of the Loud Pack Centre. Um, there was preparation for his chance or to change Hague Academy lectures, teaching commitments in the LLM course, as well as the administrative load that goes along with that, as well as, of course, his suite of PhD students. Before the ICJ, there was Nicaragua and Colombia, representing Colombia when Honduras applied to intervene. There was the certain activities case between Costa Rica and Nicaragua across a number of phases. The maritime dispute between Peru and Chile, the Cambodia-Thailand interpretation case, the Firom and Greece case, and of course, whaling. In addition to this, there were a number of legal advices. There was appointments as a member of various tribunals. There were contributions to Festschrift, forewords, journal articles, and then of course, the rewriting of Brownlee's principles of public international law. And I want to say that one of these works reflects James, but in truth, they all do. And this is what makes James so unique. His absolute mastery of multiple issues across the spectrum of international law, his very personal commitment to both the practice of international law and the teaching of international law. He treated each of these immense tasks as equally worthy of his time and attention. And I think that is what makes James so special and so unique, and that is why he will be so deeply missed. He mentored so many of us. He contributed to so many texts that we rely on, and he participated in real lawmaking. 
And there are few that could ever hope to match his breadth and depth or his contribution to our discipline. So to my mentor, my friend and my guide, I say thank you for changing my life in the most wonderful way and putting me on the path that I still follow today. Thank you. Thanks, Juliet. Uh, now, Douglas Guilfoyle, who is an Associate Professor of International Law and Security at UNSW Canberra, and you may have seen uh, the beautiful tribute that Douglas wrote to uh, James, uh, and we are looking forward to hearing from Douglas now. Um, thank you, Anne. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people from whose unceded land I'm speaking this evening and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I've also got to uh, acknowledge um, Juliet's beautiful tribute and indirectly uh, Juliet uh, and her husband Joe are some of the great friends of my life and I wouldn't know them had uh, in a sense we not been indirectly introduced by James. Um, but on other matters, um, the comedian Alice Fraser once said you never know what you've left in others' lives. And I'm going to be, I think, the second person to introduce a sort of physical object. So um, my son plays in the bath uh, with this rubber duck that's obviously wearing a barrister's gown. Um, now, it was a table decoration from the surprise dinner matrix chambers through for James and for Freya on his election to the ICJ at the Ivy. Um, as we've already heard, James was invariably very kind to small children and indeed to my son on the one occasion they met in, of all places, the Pera Palace Hotel in Istanbul, where uh, the Mauritius UK UNCLOS arbitration was being heard. And so I think the fact that this duck is now a part of his legacy and my family um, would amuse him. Now, I first met James in 1998 in Washington, DC, in the final rounds of the uh, Jessup moot. Um, but my the theme of my remarks is really what James left in my life as a PhD supervisor, where I'll, I'll very much be echoing some of the points made by Margaret and uh, drawing uh, on material uh, in my tribute to James for Opinio Juris. Amongst those stories, um, really what my favorite was one told by Ivan Shearer, another great international lawyer of Adelaide, sadly no longer with us. And it came from a time when James was visiting Australia and staying with Ivan. And Ivan told me over drinks in Trinity College, Dublin. Um, I got up in the night to go to the loo. It was about four in the morning. I passed James's door and the light was on and I could hear his keyboard tapping. I asked him the next day what on earth he was doing. I was awake, James said. So I was helping a PhD student. This for me sums up a great deal of James as I knew him. His relentless traveling schedule, his seeming ability to function without sleep, his astonishing capacity for work, and his dedication to his students. Uh, those of us, uh, including Margaret, who were supervised by James, will occasionally recall with envy the lot of other PhD students at Cambridge. They would submit a draft chapter to their supervisor, and in the two to four weeks it might take to get Comet to relax, possibly even take a short holiday. This was not our experience. This has already been mentioned, I think. I, I once sent James a draft on a Friday morning, and. By the time I got in from the pub that night, had a heavily red-lined markup sitting in my email with a suggestion I meet him at 9.30 the next morning, a Saturday in his office at the Lauterpack Centre, where he would indicate the fact that it was a casual day by still wearing a collared shirt and tie, but with uh, an old polar fleece. In any event, the fact that I finished my PhD ahead of schedule was perhaps not entirely my own doing. Uh, but for me, it took a while to get past the terror, or at least the awe, of his incisive intelligence. Um, at my first supervision meeting with him in 2004, he asked me, uh, perhaps unpromisingly, to remind him of my topic. Um, Stopping and searching ships on the high seas in times of peace and war, I stammered uncertainly. Hmm, reflected James, not a field I know a great deal about. I'm sure I'll learn a lot from you, but the topic seems too big. How are you harbour? I gulped, um, perhaps I could focus on peacetime law enforcement. He nodded. And what will you do first? Uh, the treaty practice grew out of narcotics interdiction, so I should probably start with drug smuggling. He nodded again. Good. Write a paper on drug smuggling treaties then. So I left, and I did, having been quite gently but very directly guided to the path I needed to follow. 
And indeed, I left each of our meetings feeling I'd had at least an hour of his time with my head stuffed full of things I needed to be thinking about. But in truth, I don't think any lasted longer than 15 to 20 minutes and possibly no longer than 10 to 15. Uh, with me, at least, there was little small talk and every sentence he spoke was always precise and densely freighted with meaning. Uh, under those conditions, it took me a year to realise he quite liked me, which said much more about me than him. As has been said, he was notoriously kind to students. Uh, having achieved the summit of his profession and discipline, he was determined to leave the ladder down behind him, he created opportunities, as we've heard, and was encouraging and not just to his stable of PhD students and researchers. Indeed, I've had former colleagues from other institutions reach out to say they had, early in their career, emailed James out of the blue to ask him for advice, never dreaming of a reply, and then had one in hours. That was not something I'd heard before he passed. That said, James took an evident and continued interest in the career of his PhD students, and I suspect liked nothing more than seeing us succeed. He was very fond of telling me that I, I needed to be applying for my next promotion. In any event, in December 2019, I was lucky enough to be able to uh, visit him and also see Freya at the Peace Palace. He was exceedingly kind, um, taking the better part of an hour to chat with me and talking relatively little about the issues before the court, but showing a keen interest in my current work and insisting I sent him my recent articles. I did, and within a few days received one of his pithy sentence and a half replies, which nonetheless showed he'd read them closely. Finally, he was a tireless referee. Early in my career, I had once, during a flurry of applications, apologised to him for asking for so many references when his time was so valuable. He wrote to me that it was in the nature of the supervisor-supervisee relationship that I could call on him for a reference without advance notice for, and I quote, the term of our joint lives. It was a generous act expressed with his usual dry wit. I'm just so sorry that term's come to an end. As I said before, much of what he taught me by example about PhD supervision boils down to everyone is worth your time, read closely but guide gently, and leave the ladder down behind you. He left so much in so many of our lives. And I'll, I'll use again about him the quote I've used before from Wordsworth. Uh, he so much reflected that best portion of a good man's life is his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Douglas. I'd now like to call on Philippe Sands, who is a professor of laws and director of the Centre on International Courts and Tribunals at University College London. He's a member of Matrix Chambers. Uh, he's, of course, a prolific author, uh, and he wrote a beautiful uh, obituary of James in The Guardian. Uh, Philippe. Thank you so much, Anne, and the Australian New Zealand Societies for International Law and everyone who's spoken. It's really a privilege to be here as an honorary Antipodean, and I hope with the passing of James that entitlement won't come to an end. I met James for the first time in 1987. It was in Cairo in Egypt. I was a note taker on the secretariat of a very renowned, long established association of international lawyers, and he was newly elected as the youngest ever member. And of course, I met the James that we all came to know and love, the one who wanted to spend time with the most junior and unknown of participants, eating and drinking, talking and engaging, totally different from every other member. And of course, even then, young James was irreverent, but always in that incredibly courteous and warm and loving uh, of ways. And we became friends almost instantly. And he really did change the course of my working life. This is something that others who have spoken today have also said. He was an early supporter of my pursuits in various activities that were somehow not seen as traditional amongst the British international law community, like creating an NGO in the field of environment or getting involved on environmental matters, a subject that James's uh, beloved thesis advisor, Ian Brownlee, didn't even think counted as a subject of, of international law at all. James's encouragement and independence, his willingness to act against his own country, was really vital to so many of us. 
it gave a sense of legitimacy to ideas that seemed, back then at least, somehow beyond the outer edges of the mainstream. And that was an incredibly important social function that James played. He arrived in England in 1992, and he was, very frankly, a breath of fantastic Australian fresh air. He changed everything. He swept away a lot of the crusty hierarchies and conventions, and he helped to create a new generation of international lawyers. We've heard from some of them speaking this evening who were engaged, who were encouraged to move out of sort of the ghettos of international law into the mainstream of life, political life and legal life. And in 1994, he gave me an opportunity to work on my first contentious case at the International Court of Justice in very difficult personal circumstances for me and for my wife, because we had just experienced the loss of a child in pregnancy. It was a very, very difficult moment. And James wanted to help. He wanted to help me and he wanted to help Natalia and he wanted to sort of offer a distraction. And that was his way of doing it. And I will never forget that kindness and that decency and the love that he showed at the moment. It was just James. And we went on to do literally dozens of cases together. And his style was inimitable. As a young barrister in those days brought up in the wonderful English context, I was very used to my learned leader telling me before we went into a consultation with some government minister or an attorney general, not to speak until the leader had given me a nod that it was okay to speak. And I remember the first consultation I did with James, I asked him whether that's what he wanted. And he just looked at me like I was a crazy person. He just said, no, of course not. If you've got an idea, just jump in. And others who are smiling as I'm saying this, just know that that was James's style. The hierarchy was totally flat. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, he took as the leader the key decision. But he was so encouraging. He was so different from everyone else in encouraging the younger members of the community to say what they thought in application of a principle that he held so dear, which is that the best ideas often emerge from the youngest and most unexpected of minds. To be a member of a team working with James was a totally joyful and happy experience. That's been touched on by so many people. And we had a hoot in so many of the cases. I remember an arbitration we did in the 1990s. It was his first uh, exit case ever. Uh, unbelievably, one that I brought him into, which he was thrilled about. And we toddled off to Albania and we were lodged in the guest house of the former dictator, Enver Hoxha. And we sort of marveled at the vast bathrooms, but without running water. And actually, apropos Douglas, and the rubber ducks, there was in this vast guest house, unbelievably in the entrance hallway, a pond where there was no water in the taps or in the showers or in the baths, but there was this pond filled with rubber ducks. And we would just stand <laughs> admiring the rubber ducks at that moment. Uh, that was a, a really curious case. There was a jurisdiction phase, there was a merits phase, four rounds of written pleadings, two sets of oral hearings, and the total fee was pitifully small. And it was just shared equally among everybody because James had really zero interest in money, in baubles, in personal glory. It really was just about substance and ideas. And that was inspirational for so many of us. He was an immensely driven human being. But what really drove him? I can't answer that fascinating question. It's one for the psychoanalysts rather than the lawyers. But being driven didn't make him personally ambitious or greedy. And I think we all of us sensed that about him. He was so much 
fun to work with. I mean, anecdotes, there are a plenty. There is so much to miss. I really miss the 4 a.m. emails. Always a blend of deep substance and big humor. I know exactly what Juliet is saying with the sort of terse one word thing which says so much. But often there was more, also terse, but the words played around and contained so much. And the one that always comes to mind is we had a couple of cases a few years back for Bangladesh, maritime boundary delimitations, the delimitation of the minor space known as the Bay of Bengal. And for various reasons, Bangladesh decided to bring two separate cases. They could have gone in a single case against Myanmar and India, but instead they brought one case against India and one case against Myanmar, which of course doubled the work, but avoided Myanmar and India getting a couple of judges appointed or arbitrators appointed as uh, ad hocs. And Myanmar and India then appointed a different judge or arbitrator to the panel. But they in fact both appointed uh, a leading Indian jurist and they both happened to be called Mr. Rao, R-A-O. And I will never forget the email that came in a few minutes later as news seeped through, what James had put into the subject header of the email, quintessential James, two rows, one dispute. And that absolutely encapsulated how he thought about these kind of issues. In court, as many of you who worked with him will know, the preparation was just absolutely voracious arguments would be constructed and presented around the perceived propensities of the judges who were actually sitting. It was from him that I learned, pay great deal of attention to who is on the bench. Look at what they've written, look at what they've decided. And we would focus on individual judges, literally spending hours and hours nattering, trying to work out what might motivate one of the key judges, X or Y, to nudge them in slightly towards our side. And yet, in the midst of this fastidious preparation, there would be the most fantastic expressions of total absent-mindedness. I wasn't going to show an image, but as Hillary wonderfully uh, has, and Douglas has lifted a duck, uh, I'm just going to put up on the screen, if share screens uh, works, one image um, that you can uh, see. Uh, I, I hope, um, right now, um, which is uh, an image of um, James in a tie. Well, it's, it's, it's not coming up, I'm afraid, on my share screen, so I will just have to uh, describe it. But it was an occasion uh, in which uh, James, rushing into court at the last moment uh, in the uh, team a room simply grabbed the wrong gown for the hour long pleading that he was about to make. And he picked up absent mindedly the gown of one of our fine Indian colleagues who happened to be diminutive in size, under five foot high. He pleaded for an hour, apparently without ever noticing that anything was wrong, in a gown of body cringing tightness that didn't even reach his knees. We were in, you know, cracked up as we were watching him plead. And you could spot some of the judges sort of leaning <laughs> forward and trying to see what it was that seemed different about James's appearance on this case. Over the 35 years that I knew him, he changed not an iota. Even as his global renown grew, he always remained open and approachable, progressive, excited about some new challenge, a total font of intellectual ideas and qualities, and an encyclopedic store of information marked by his own particular Adelaide style of very human qualities. He had a generosity of spirit, a humility, in a field which is very often, but not always, 
marked by self-importance. James, as you know, hated nothing more than those who were stuck up their own asses. He was open to ideas, irrespective of where they came from, utterly committed to matters of principle, whether it be indigenous peoples, Iraq, or investor state arbitration. He embraced collegiality and mentorship. Every account of him refers to his relationship with his students. He had a warm sense of humor. He loved sport. He was always questioning me about the cases on the court of arbitration for sport that I was doing, particularly tiddlywinks and drafts. He loved Australian wines, and he was always in the search for a good read on yet another of those crazy long flights. He was a voracious reader of fiction and nonfiction, and James was about language and words. They were at the very heart of his being. What mattered to James always was the substance, not the messenger, not the form. And it was right that all the way to the very end. We were due to sit together in a hearing just a few days ago, and right till the very end, it was unimaginable to James somehow that the case would not proceed without him. That sense of energy and fight, which was always expressed with warmth and humor, imbued with a sense of the human spirit, the struggle against our own frailties, was something magnificent. James leaves a huge legacy in the field that he dominated for decades, but he leaves an even bigger legacy at the human level, a myriad of individual moments which we have recalled on this evening of sheer wonderfulness. I love you, James, and I'm gonna miss you very much. Thank you for everything you've given us. Thank you, Philippe. And finally, Emily Crawford, who is an associate professor at the University of Sydney Law School, and she is also the daughter of James Crawford. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you for inviting me to, to say a few words this evening. It, it shouldn't surprise you uh, that as, as early as I can remember, international law was part of uh, the air I breathed at home, uh, though perhaps not always by choice. Uh, growing up, I, I vaguely knew that the uh, that building the Franklin Dam in Tasmania was possibly going to be contrary to international law. I sort of knew that Australia had done something problematic in Nauru. And uh, slightly more controversially, rather than taking us to Disneyland, my, my sister and I would instead be treated to a lecture about Spanish colonization at the Mission San Juan Capistrano, you know, like every eight-year-old dreams of. I hadn't planned on doing a law degree. Uh, when I did, my father was famously uncomfortable with it. Uh, but he was so passionate about the law, I had to know what he was banging on about. Um, truth be told, I actually only studied public international law because it fit my timetable. Uh, as it turned out, I completely loved it. And when I announced that I was planning on doing a PhD in international law, my father was famously opposed to it. He tried to talk me out of it and was really, really against it. And truth be told, there were some things he did at the beginning of my career that actively hindered my, uh, my academic progress. Uh, the most notorious of which was he forbade me from submitting my PhD manuscript to Cambridge University Press which as any academic knows, kind of puts you behind the eight ball. You know, if, you, if Cambridge is out of the running, there's Oxford and then you, you kind of want to start from there. I realized very quickly though, that this wasn't him gatekeeping. It was actually him trying to protect me. He didn't want my career to always come with an asterisk to people you know, always shrugging their shoulders and, and chalking up any success I might have had uh, to nepotism. And he actually said as much to me a few years ago that early on he had been worried that I was going to be Ellie to his Hirsch, uh, that I would be Ellie Lauterpacht forever in the shadow of his, his father, uh, never able to live up to it. And I actually told him point blank, A, I should be so lucky to have Ellie Lauterpacht's career, uh, and B, even if I hadn't had come to international law as late as I did, uh, 
um, I would still have to live to be 400 and never sleep again to even come close to what my father has achieved. And unlike my father, I need more than four hours of sleep a night to function. And I think this experience, from what I'm hearing from everyone today, this experience resonates with everyone who worked with dad, who worked for dad, um, and even those who worked uh, on the other side of the desk from dad. He was both very protective of his students and his colleagues, and he was very generous to his students and his colleagues. He was as likely to debate the merits of a recent ICSID decision with you as he was to argue that Australia should take physical possession of the ashes urn whenever they win, which is, let's be honest, all the time. Um, he loved bad puns and good wine, and he was as quick with a letter of recommendation um, as he was a recommendation of what historical novel was worth reading. Uh, I think everything that could have been said about Dad tonight has been said, uh, but I, I do want to finish tonight by bastardizing Shakespeare a little and by saying he was a man, take him for all in all, we shall not look upon his like again. Thank you, Emily. So one of the difficult things of this format and of this time in history is that we can't see the faces of the audience. Uh, and we're so grateful that I know there are many of you watching. Uh, it's a slightly awkward format, but if there's anyone who did want to say anything in the Q&A, you'd be very welcome to type that in. And I can see some people are uh, speaking to the panelists. But otherwise, I uh, see that we really are close to the end of the time we had available to us. And I wanted to, before saying anything else, thank everyone who spoke uh, tonight and presented those thoughtful, insightful, deeply moving uh, recollections and reflections on James Crawford and his life and his contributions. We hope that together these glimpses convey something of what he meant to so many people, of what a brilliant lawyer he was, what an inspiring teacher, what a generous mentor, uh, what a devoted father, and what a steadfast friend and ally, ally he was to so many of us around the world. Uh, so I saw him in The Hague the very last time I left this country before our borders closed. I can't quite believe he won't be there when the world opens up again. So thank you for joining us this evening <laughs> and sharing in this tribute uh, to the life and work of James from his Antipodean and honorary Antipodean colleagues and friends. I'm sure it's the first of many such tributes that we'll see from around the world. <laughs>